Can we start? Yes, let's proceed. Okay. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Hello and welcome to all who joined today for the second day of the third annual Kix uh, Symposium. My name is Florencio Ceballos. I'm a senior program specialist with the Knowledge Innovation Exchange at the International Development Research Center, IDRC. Um, before we begin, please uh, note that you may use your functions in Zoom to ask questions and in case you have any technical issues. Um, interpretation is available in English, French and Spanish. And you may select your uh, preferred uh, language by clicking on the globe at the bottom, uh, the globe icon at the bottom of the of your screen and selecting the, the language you prefer, English, Spanish or, or French. Um, please note as well that the symposium is being uh, recorded in all three languages and will be available later. Today, uh, we will hear uh, very interesting inputs and discussions on data systems and data use. Um, following a welcome uh, and opening uh, remarks on day two uh, by uh, Nasser Farouki, we'll have a panel of discussions on KICS data systems and data use in education. Before that, uh, and, be, and after that, an upgrade on KICS projects uh, over the last year and the close for this year's symposium. Uh, let me pass the floor to Mr. Naruki, Nasser Farouki, Director of Education and Science at IDRC, to, all, to open today's session. Um, over to you, Nasser. Thanks a lot, uh, Floro. Uh, and um, bonjour tout le monde. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking on unceded uh, territory of the Ashinaabi people. Uh, it's a great pleasure to participate in this symposium organized by GPE and KICS to discuss and debate the findings and lessons our research is enabling. We're really eager to hear how our research can contribute to uh, um, educational change in a decisive way. We'd like to ensure that the decisions of those that are involved in policymaking are supported by evidence and by the advances that the research community has made. Building rigorous, innovative evidence appropriate to the needs of countries and local communities is a systemic effort involving much more than just funding research. It consists of supporting the entire research cycle from the design and the collection of data to its use in decision-making spaces. And this is precisely what KIX aims to do. We believe that without support for applied research to raise its standards even higher, incorporating, for example, gender perspectives that ensure the inclusiveness of its questions, findings, and approaches, this task is incomplete. Likewise, we can't move the needle on making education systems more effective, resilient, and inclusive without scaling educational innovations, but making sure that that's informed by the best evidence. We're convinced that involving decision makers, practitioners, local stakeholders, and researchers, fostering collaboration and strengthening capacities to add value and use data, that this effort is not complete. And also this evidence can't achieve the expected impacts without an intentional way to circulate and mobilize knowledge synthesized in a way that reaches and is helpful to those who need it. And those efforts made by our regional hubs, such as the one uh, which will be presented today by Marina, point in this direction. But that evidence isn't built out of thin air, it's built on data. And improving the quality access and use of uh, that data is an effort in which IDRC has long been engaged and we're working on that direction um, with the help of our KICS research partners such as UNICEF, University of Oslo and others. IDRC embraces um, particular principles of openness of data that we share with our partners. Um, I'm actually the, um, the chair of IDRC's um, open research data policy, and we really encourage the sharing, the sharing of our research data, and we encourage researchers to make their data available, and we work proactively with them um, to ensure that it's open and accessible to all that might use it and reuse it. 
um, for impact. We understand that access to quality data enables ministries of education and specialized agencies to promote systemic and necessary changes, but systems must be in place to capture, um, to allow for the capture, the aggregation, the presentation, and the use of that data, and the implementation and improvement of education management information systems, or EMIS, with efforts such as those that we will hear from our panelists today, aims to do just that. Um, and in particular, it, it seeks to help the data help reach all that need it, not only as aggregated data that's available to the highest levels of decision making um, and ministries, which is undoubtedly fundamental, but also at the intermediate and uh, local levels. School leaders and the local scientific community can help improve and make sense of that data and effectively convert it into actionable evidence. That's critical. This is why efforts such as those of the Ministry of Education of Madagascar and the Gambia as owners and co-creators of such improvements in data systems um, are essential. And it's also possible and necessary to imagine new, more sophisticated ways of using that data. Uh, the project How Data Must Speak is looking at the granularity behind the data and identifying positive deviances. Those are a step in that direction. It's also important to understand that data and information management systems uh, are not static systems. Along with ensuring continuity and long-term vision, they must adapt to the needs of the time. The pandemic has presented uh, EMIS with new challenges, how to reflect better their, the system's resilience, their ability to operate in hybrid systems, and the capture of information related to the incorporation of technologies in the process. And in addition, the dramatic learning losses that education systems worldwide face due to the disruptions caused by uh, the pandemic require a re-interrogation of those systems. We need to ask whether they're telling us everything we need to know and whether they're used in a way we need to maximize their usefulness and relevance. So I'm really looking forward to discussions on that this, uh, this morning. Without further ado, I would like to welcome the panel for a very exciting conversation. Over to you, Hamidou. No, 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 I think it's the first. Uh, thank you, Nasser. Um, so now we'll move to the discussion. I would like to welcome the participants, Terje Axel Sanner from the University of Oslo, Alpha Ba from the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education of the Gambia, uh, Renaud Comba from UNICEF Research Office in Osenti, um, Mrs. Bohangi Rahali Manansoa. Sorry, I... Ex uh, Try that before, but still hard name to pronounce. From the Ministry of Education of Madagascar, um, Marina Drefrote from NORAC and, Asia, and the Asia Pacific Hub from Kix, and Musada from the Ministry of Education of the Maldives. So I invite my colleague Hamidou Bukhari, who will facilitate uh, this section. Uh, this session. Thank you, Hamidou, and over to you. Okay. Thank you, Floro. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. As Flora said, my name is Hamidou Bukhari. I'm, I'm going to be the moderator of the, of the panel. I'm senior program specialist at the IDRC where I work on KICS. Uh, first of all, let me thank Nasser for the excellent opening remarks that have set a nice backdrop to the discussion we're going to have with our panelists. Uh, by way of introduction, I'd like to say that our panelists represent the two main mechanisms KICS uses to deliver its mission in GP partner countries. Uh, the global project for knowledge generation, uh, for knowledge uh, and, and evidence generation. And then we have the hubs that will be represented by the EEP uh, hub for knowledge and innovations exchange to promote inter-country learning and uptake of evidence in policy and planning processes. We will begin our panel discussions with uh, two of the KICS global projects on data systems and the ministries that they serve, uh, here meaning uh, Gambia and Madagascar. Then we'll proceed with one of the four KICS hubs, namely the Europe Asian Pacific hub or EAP hub, and uh, one of their member countries, uh, uh, the Maldives. In terms of timekeeping, I'll be very strict uh, with my panelists. 
as we would like to have about 20 minutes for uh, some Q&A at the end of the panel discussions. Uh, I'd like to invite our distinguished participants to please post their questions in the Q&A uh, box, or uh, if they have comments, in the, they could put their comments in the chat if they don't have specific questions, and please direct your questions to specific speakers. Each panelist will have a maximum of uh, seven minutes to answer the question addressed to him or her. So uh, without much ado, I'd like to begin with uh, our first uh, global project, uh, the Data Use Innovation for Education Management Information Systems uh, in the Gambia, Uganda, and Togo. And I will call on uh, Terrier, uh, the Institute of uh, Informatics University of Oslo to answer the following questions. How is this project, Terrier, uh, bringing about a major shift in the way MS data is produced, presented, and used at key decision-making levels? And what do you hope to see as a result? So I'll start my timer. You have seven, maximum seven minutes. Thank you for the introduction and question, Hamidou. So maybe just for the audience, for those who don't know me, but might have heard about the project in some uh, capacity, uh, this is a project that to some extent pivots around a software called DHIS2 and a network or ecosystem of, uh, of uh, actors uh, called HISP. And the program has a long history of working with the health sector. So some of us might, might think of us or know, know of us as the, the people with some experience from health also now uh, engaging with education. And we work quite holistically with information system strengthening. So EMIS strengthening in, in these three countries, uh, Togo, Uganda, and the Gambia, also other countries, but these are the three in the kicks mechanism. And what I would like to, to, to use these seven minutes, there are many interesting experiences from our project, but one thing I would like to, to highlight is maybe the role of the district in, in, uh, in education management. Uh, coming from health, I know there has been a long history since the 1978 Alma Alta Declaration on primary health care to, to strengthen health districts. And I think a similar policy debate discussion on, on empowering districts with data um, is, is, is needed. And it's, it's, not, it's not that it's non-existent, but I think we need to emphasize the role of the district in bridging international national policy down to the operational level. And to be able to do that, of course, you need more frequent and more granular data than what has been historically collected through census and survey often on a yearly basis. So empowering district with data. And in order to do that, of course, you also need data systems that can handle this data and provide process and analyze data uh, in, in a meaningful way at the district level, uh, looking at you know, what kind of indicators are meaningful to, to, to district officials and even school inspectors that are bridged between district and, and the school. So my, my worry is maybe that we in shifting uh, from kind of census and survey data to individual records, which many are interested in and transactional data, we also need to remember that we don't jump to the school and individuals, but empower the district who are the only kind of entity that can kind of bridge policy and, and practice. Um, so really invest, investing in districts in data systems and of course capacity building then to be able to customize and analyze data uh, using the, the more richer granular or more, and more timely data uh, coupled with flexible data systems. So our project really uh, emphasizes all of these dimensions, uh, identifying more uh, relevant data for the district level and subnational levels in general, uh, building robust and flexible data systems and building capacity both to mold and maintain and cultivate those systems. And of course, also the analytical capacity to leverage all this data. So I think that's that's our main main focus. And of course, we also see at the district, there is a lot of synergies, possible synergies with other sectors like health. COVID-19 is of course a perfect illustration of how health and education has had to work together and find common data sources and exchange data. <laughs> yeah, I think we have Alpha. <laughs> You're the next speaker. <laughs> so, and of course, these things need to 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 evolve in conjunction. I mean, we cannot have a plethora of data without 
data systems that really affords analysis of this. And of course, we cannot. That this is meaningless if, unless we have the human capacity to really turn it into sense making processes, policies, operational decisions. So a lot of our work is around capacity building, like I said, shaping the systems. But also, what I would like to see actually uh, is is more kind of policy debate, both national and international, around you know what are useful indicators, analysis. Now that we move towards more and more data, what types of data should district managers be looking at? You know, to deal with inequalities, with learning outcomes, not on a yearly basis, but much more rapidly. So, so. Tools and guidance, guidelines, policy discussions around uh, facilitating data use and exchange uh, between subnational uh, levels from country to country. What is working in, in one country? How can it be replicated or facilitated in other countries in terms of subnational level decision decision making? I think those are key key points for us, and of course, this will require funding from the international landscape, both into data systems, but also capacity building mechanisms, empowering universities to train the qualified cadre of, of education specialists who can actually leverage the rich data sources that are inevitable, I think, in, in terms of digitalization. They will be created as a side effect of digitalizing all the processes at the school level slowly. There will be data, but then we need to think carefully about how that data can turn into managerial decisions, not just operational decisions. Any follow-up question from you, Hamidou? Oh, okay, you have, you have done well. You still have uh, a minute to go. So uh, I don't have any particular follow-up, but I think during the, because I'd like to make use of this time to hmm. call on now, uh, Alpha. Alpha, can you hear us? Alpha? Yes, uh, I can hear, yes. Yeah, uh, okay. Can you, so, can you confirm uh, yeah. you can hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you properly. So here is the question here for you, Alpha. How has your government used this project to adapt its education management information system, including policy or decision-making processes, and what material effects are these contributing to? Over to you, Alpha. Yeah. Thank you very much, for, um, Buhari, for letting Gambia to participate in this very important symposium. Uh, definitely for us as a country, uh, we were really challenged to do more than what we were doing. We have an image system where we had our education policies, the past education policies, 98 education policies, 2014, 15. All these policies we are talking about having individual data system and in a, to do more alpha. by our managers by our minister yeah. by the, yes Sorry, we're, we're losing yeah you're fading you're fading maybe it's not a problem okay you can hear okay. me now yeah it's better okay. now I will yes. say, okay ah, let me hide out from there yeah because so you, you have some background are, noise there's some background noise yeah. also okay <laughs> We were, we were really challenged as a ministry, and, and it, it, from 2009, we've been talking about um, having better system in our education system. Internally, the ministry, the um, senior management team, wanted us to do individual students, wanted us to do more than what we were doing, because we are collecting school forms, school IDs, and people were asking for more. So in another words, uh, what we were producing in terms of data to inform policy was not enough for, for, for what the, the demand from the internal stakeholders mean. Externally, if you look at the, the National Development Plan um, within the country, there were a this call for us to harmonize our data to, to have one data set that it will be used for um, e-government, whereby we'll have a data uh, that will be connected with health, um, finance, edu uh, education, and others. And the National Development Plan, according to the President and Minister of Finance, we are saying we need a dashboard. So we are challenged from government also to make sure that our data is interoperable, it can be shared. Then you have the SDGs who was asking all the data that is overlapping in health, in nutrition, in other other order, order subsectors. You know, now we have different ministries that are dealing with even children ministry and gender ministry. So then we are this challenge. What what can we do? So while we are 
uh, trying to find out what is the best solution for the next way forward. Luckily, we had, we, we stumbled on University of Oslo and DHIS. And one of the advantage we saw that they were, DHIS was in the Gambia for since 2009. And we were looking at if DHIS is in health and they are measuring um, data around the child at the, at the clinic and at the district health center. So we, we have our school close by. Wherever you have a child visiting a clinic, the same child will be visiting the school later or in fact the same day. So then we thought, why not we rely work with health? That way will be, it will be very good for government data, data, data interoperability to start using that because health is a big sector and education is also a big sector. If these two sectors are able to work together and have one data system using one platform, hopefully we will, we will respond to the need for the national and sectoral need that is being called about the presidential task. So this are some of the things that we were, but as a, as a team, we could not have just jumped into it because one of the biggest problems we had over the years, um, since the 1980s before we joined the plan unit and over the past 20 years since we joined, one of the biggest challenges is there is always a tool supported by a partner. Sometimes it's DFID, USAID, sometimes it's EU, sometimes it's World Bank, but this tool has been the focus. EMIS, to, uh, EMIS emphasis over the years has always been on the tool, on the, on the database, on the data system, not on the, the capacity to, make, to, to ensure that that data system, when it is there, it will continue. So as a result, what happened in the, over, the, over the 20 years is whenever that project exists, that data system exists. So then we say, ah, oh, when Alpha, for example, when Alpha and CD were here, they had reported data A today. But after Alpha and CD left, the system is crumbled. They start having backlog of data. So then we said, for us to work with UIO on this project, supported by GPE as part of the old DRT uh, solution, with the emphasis would be on the capacity, building capacity, ensuring that institutions like University of the Gambia or tertiary institutions would be supporting the research component, working piggy banking on UIO, so that they will build capacity. While at the same time, while because we cannot wait, the demand I mentioned earlier. Ministers are asking for new data, new way of doing things. While that is happening, we are also uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a parallel system, we are building those things. So this were, this were some of the things we benefited as a country. It came at a time mm -hmm. when we were struggling because one of the biggest challenges as a team, even without the capacity component, what can we do with the individual ID? Even getting mm -hmm. an individual ID that is unique for every child, we were struggling with that. But luckily, the UIO partnership helped us address that. That was one of the biggest challenges. And the other solution, the, 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 the partnership address was the new tools. Remember, we are using aggregate data. We, mm -hmm. we are using all questionnaires. All those things that we are using virtually, 80% of it has to change or was produced. So what do you do with a new instrument for collecting data for individual profile? What do you do? So these are the tools we are working with them for over the past years. How, what is the new instrument going to look like? What is the new uh, schema of the data that's going to look like? Who will do what? And who will do, who will do, who, what will happen? And the biggest shift, which is historical, in addition to the shifting from aggregate to individual, another shift is moving the data system from the headquarter level. EMIS predominantly has always been for the director of planning, but now how do we ensure we decentralize EMIS to the school level? Mm -hmm. This partnership has helped us give us a model where school level, data reporting, collection and reporting is possible, at regional level is possible, and we are building a cohort of staff at the planning directorate, at the focal point, regional focal point and cluster. So we have a host of a lot of things happening at the same time. For us, mm -hmm. we can only say that Gambia was very lucky, and really we are lucky to have this um, relationship with University of Oslo and the support that partners are providing to ensure it happens. So to be honest, in a, in a, in a conclusion, we were like, um, it was like yeah. a very good um, block for us. Over okay, just uh, uh, Alpha, we still have a minute, so I have a follow up question. What yes. kind of um, uh, enabling environment does one need to be able to operate the shifts that you're uh, uh, operating now within, within the Gambia uh, in terms of building the institutional capacity uh, and, and also? Uh, building you know the infrastructure so please tell us a little bit about that uh, that uh, enabling environment or ecosystem that you're creating 
Yeah, actually, the, the, that's a very good question, and we almost uh, usually oversight the enabling and supportive environment. We are struggling as a ministry where we have to struggle with so the issue of connectivity, the issue of energy, which is our other sector. So we need an enabling environment where, as a Ministry of Education and Data People, we focus only on our, our mandate. We don't have to worry about providing electricity, providing connectivity, but we have to worry about it. Plus, the policy enabling environment, the kind of data system we are asking for are no more, uh, they are granular, individual, and private uh, private data. Uh, they, could be, they are no more aggregate. So we need a very good legal supportive environment that will allow us so that this data we can collect it and it will increase the response rate. Some of the private school are asking us questions. I say we are not supposed to give you data about individual children. How do you enforce that? The education policy, the education act, all the regulations that I hear are old. So we need a, a, a new regulation, new policy for privacy, for security, for data security, for ownership. Those things kind of things need to be need to help us, enable us. And again, if you are talking about university design and university of Oslo and other people, how do we make sure we have a very good support, uh, legal and institutional environment relationship between all these actors so that it is, it is smooth running? So we really need that. That is the soft part, which is the legal, which is also the most difficult part because we don't expect the image team to lead it. We don't expect UIO to come and help us do the regulation. We need Minister of Justice and other people to lead. But what we can do from GP and UIO is to learn best practices and influence our, our, our government so that we can ensure that we have this enabling and supportive environment to ensure that the legal environment is right, the policy environment is right, the, the connectivity environment and the and the and the and the and the, um, the, the electricity environment is right. So these yeah, are some exactly. of the big things that are that are happening. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Alpha. So now we're going to, to switch gears. We're going to go to our second uh, global project. Uh, this is the data must speak about uh, positive deviance approaches to learning. And I'm going to call on uh, Renaud Kamba from UNICEF Office of Research in Osanti. And the question uh, for you, Renaud, is um, what well, we have to kind of, uh, you, you, you'll have to choose, uh, but I think we can combine these two, these two questions. What is the key objective of this project? And in what ways does it differ from other data focus initiatives that UNICEF leads? Uh, alternative, if you can combine in your answer, and so the answer to this, uh, how is this project helping education systems act on data to support change? Over sure. to you, Reno. Thanks, Amidou. Hi, Amidou. Hi, everyone. Greetings from Ghana, where they are holding the National Education Week this week. Um, it's a very good question, Amidou. So first of all, the Data Must Speak research was designed for three main reasons. First, the acknowledgement that many ministries of education in Africa are spending millions of dollars collecting EMS data every year, and yet very often um, it is not it is underanalyzed and undervalued in a lot of countries. The second reason is uh, the acknowledgement that um, teachers and head teachers and inspectors and district officials have been operating, have been doing their best um, in certain contexts, in certain challenging contexts, and that they might have come uh, up with local solutions uh, to solve some of their education problems. And the third uh, reason why we designed this research is this global learning poverty rate that doesn't seem to decrease and that has you know, increased even more uh, with COVID, now reaching, I think, 87% of children under the age of 10 or at the age of 10 that cannot read a simple text uh, post-COVID. So this multi-country, multi-year research aims at leveraging administrative data sets to identify those exceptional schools, those schools that are performing so much better than their peers, even though they're operating in the same context and with similar resources, and to then try to understand what is it that those teachers, those head teachers, those inspectors within those exceptional schools are doing so that the school is having better um, foundational literacy and numeracy learning outcome, better equity and better retention rates. So one of the very important component of the data must speak research is first to merge all of this administrative data sets together. I'm talking about the EMS, uh, I'm talking about the learning assessments, I'm talking about examination data, and when possible, even household, uh, household surveys. And so to do this, we work hand in hand with ministries of education and country stakeholders to merge those data sets at school level, if not sometimes when possible, even at student level. And so in the process, we aim at uh, building capacity, at showcasing the power of administrative data, 
Um, and we try to strengthen data systems in the education, in the overall education ecosystem. So for example, uh, we finalized stage one of the research in Ghana and we uh, and the Ministry of Education in Ghana um, is submitting a GP system capacity grant. And so they embedded some of our first uh, recommendations on how to improve data system. In Chad, we are planning on working with the Ministry of Education to embed some of the DMS preliminary findings within the Girl Education Acceler Accelerator grant that they are trying to submit as well. So here are four main recommendations that we have so far. The first one is it is absolutely critical to create a unique school IDs so that we can merge EMIS and exam data sets and we can merge them across years and we can merge them as well with learning assessments. This is already being done in Togo and it is being worked on in Madagascar, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana and many other countries. And so we are helping them, we are accompanying them through this journey. The second is that running in-depth statistical analysis can help quantify correlations between resource and contextual factors and school performances at central and decentralized level. So in, in Cote d'Ivoire, for example, we are even able now, together with the ministry, to estimate how much would a government investment in certain inputs to the school, such as, for example, hiring more teachers so that we can reduce PTR, or, for example, increasing uh, the visit of inspectors to schools, how much those investments would um, correlate with learning assessment, uh, with, sorry, with learning outcomes and retention rates. Third, um, with, when we have a merged data set, it is possible for ministries of education to easily run cost-effective analysis as well as regressions to understand whether introducing a new policy could make a big difference for a country. And then finally, one of the main preliminary findings that we have found across many countries is that women um, are women who are head teachers are usually heading a school that is more performing than if it is a male uh, head teacher. And so UNICEF is trying to create a new research work stream called Women in Learning Leadership uh, so that we can help ministries of education and development partners try to understand why uh, schools are uh, outperforming others if uh, they have a female leader. So this is a little bit about data must speak. I don't know, Amidou, if you have any questions. And I think you're muted, Amidou. Yes, okay. <laughs> That's an issue sometimes with the, uh, I didn't realize that my mic was, was uh, disactivated. Okay, so I'd like to go to Madame uh, Voinga. As I said, I don't have any follow-up question for you for the time being. I have like uh, other people to ask questions. I uh, just hope that we're getting more and more questions in the, in the Q&A box. Um, Madame Voinga, Ms. Voinga, I have a question for you about Madagascar. What is your government, or what has your government gotten out of this project? What are the specific challenges that you are facing in Madagascar? And how has this approach of scaling and identifying positive deviance, how has that worked for you? You have the floor. Thank you very much, Amidou. Good morning, everyone. We are very pleased to take part in this panel. This is an opportunity for us to tell you about some of our experiences in Madagascar. I'd like to say a few words about the methodological approach before I respond to your specific questions. We have adopted a specific approach that has been beneficial to us because it allows us to work with all stakeholders in every phase of our research. We have also been able to improve how we carry out our research. There are many projects that have adopted this co-creation approach. Now, getting back to your question. We are in the midst of a process that is already underway, but we've already learned a great deal. I can share three lessons that we have been particularly struck by. The first lesson is that we know what efforts need to be carried out to further strengthen capacities so that we can have quality data. We have spoken with experts from Innocenti, from UNICEF, 
and that has shown us how rich our primary database is. But we've also seen that there is still work to be done. We need more efforts so that we can abide by all of our deadlines and so that we can ensure quality from data collection to data use in schools. Secondly, research has shown us that we can study which factors determine school performance at the primary level. We can go beyond description. We can study various determinants of school performance using our databases. We have national surveys and international surveys, such as PASEC, and these are based on representative school samples. Very often, a lot of resources need to be used to collect data for these types of surveys. The third lesson we've learned is that we need to further improve the quality of our databases, which will help us use them more effectively so that we can respond to needs and better identify determinants of school performance, performance rather, without having to carry out these costly studies that I mentioned before. This will also help us envision other opportunities that will help us strengthen our databases. We can collect other types of data from schools to that end. Going back to your question, about the approach uh, regarding positive deviance and the specific challenges we're facing. Providing quality and accessible education to all children is still a major challenge for Madagascar. We have seen that there are several other challenges in the education sector. Uh, retention at the primary school level. And the imp and improving learning at every level, primary and secondary. We also see that there are many disparities in terms of conditions in schools and learning outcomes. There are disparities between different regions and between public and private schools. This research is very timely because we are in the midst of starting a process to transform education by implementing government priorities. We are hoping that the results of our research will help us with our decision-making processes. We have already received several recommendations which has shown us what actions we need to take to address some of these challenges. In my opinion, I think that we need to have good practices in schools. We need good practices. This will lead to good performance. These schools that are positive deviants, as we call them. If we can identify these schools, we can help schools with poorer performance and then help them improve their results. And we hope that this will help us address some of our national level challenges. Thank you very much for your attention. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you. We have still have a minute for your uh, presentation. So I wanted to ask a question. Based on everything that you said, you mentioned some of the challenges and some of the things that are still left to do. 
I'd like to know what sort of resources or capacities are needed in your country in order to achieve all of these things because you spoke about improving data quality you talked about the determinants of success in some schools so i'm wondering what types of capacities do you need in order to achieve these things can you hear me yes i can hear you thank you for the question for all of these challenges such as improving data quality we need to reorganize or restructure the team that is in charge of collecting data systems are already in place data is already being collected and the collection process is underway but where we're seeing obstacles or bottlenecks is other tasks carried out by stakeholders involved in data collection so we need to think about how these different actors can carry out their respective tasks and do so in a timely fashion. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, move on to the hub, uh, KICS um, EAP hub, and to talk, uh, on, to talk about the learning cycle on equitable access to education with geospatial data. So I'm going to call on uh, Marina Droy-Froté, and the question for you, Marina, is uh, could you tell us about how the hub is helping countries to address important data challenges in the EAP region? Sure. Can you hear me well? Uh, not very well. Uh, no. Can you hear me now? Oh, uh, much better now. Much better now. Okay. Please. Good. Uh, so addressing data challenges has actually been a key focus for the hub since the beginning of the activities uh, since uh, when the hub began to operate in 2020, uh, we actually conducted a study to understand what are the thematic priorities in the 21 countries that we'll be working with. Uh, and one of the key findings of this study at that uh, has influenced the hub activities in this uh, past two years has been uh, that one of the main priorities for countries is that data is not only used for reporting, but to also use education data for planning and policy. So moving away from just collecting and reporting data to also making it useful for policy and planning. So uh, the hub has been responding to this need, uh, to this demand through different types of activities. Uh, we had podcasts, webinars, workshops, and learning cycles addressing it. Uh, so maybe starting from the Kicks AP podcast, so uh, for those who are not familiar, the KICS uh, Europe Asian Pacific podcast uh, has been an important tool for us uh, to amplify the message of diverse education stakeholders from different uh, constituencies in the Europe Asian Pacific region. Uh, and across the 18 episodes that we have recorded so far, several of the guests have highlighted the importance of having evidence and data informing education implementation and how they thought this linkage could be improved, strengthened according to their experiences. Another way uh, we've been seeing, uh, we've been addressing this topic has been the webinars, as I mentioned. So we had uh, so far two, two kick CAP webinars that address the use of data for policy and planning. And these webinars, uh, the format that we have them, they're not only aimed at informing about the important research findings, but also to promote uh, knowledge exchange among participants. So having the different country representatives come uh, and discuss how the issues addressing the webinar apply to their context. And one of the webinars, uh, we had on that was focused on using data and evidence in education planning and ma management 
and a particular hi highlights uh, for that is that is the discussion that was going on among country representatives on how to critically assess data before using it for policy and planning. And we then had another webinar that also uh, addressed uh, the use of data, which this uh, was titled Data That Speaks, School Reforms That Follow. This was also an opportunity to highlight how KICS research projects in the Europe, Asian Pacific region are addressing the use of data for policy planning and implementation. And there we had the opportunity to have the colleagues from Data Must Speak initiative sharing a little bit about their research and preliminary findings, and also the UNICEF Education Analysis for Global Learning and Equity, the Mixed Eagle initiative. Uh, and in this webinar, it was also a chance to, of course, highlight uh, what research is telling us in the in the European and Pacific countries, but also to understand issues such as uh, mentioned about why some schools perform better than others, but also the root causes for poor student performance. So uh, in addition to these two types of activities that I just mentioned, the podcast and the webinars, the hub has also focused on organizing capacity strengthening activities uh, on the topic of use of data. So we had a workshop titled Using Education Data for Policy and Practice, in which we had over 50 participants from 14 of the uh, Europe, Asian Pacific countries. And in, it was a, an interesting opportunity for participants to learn more. So uh, there we had a profile of participants that are already working with data uh, and planning in their work. So we had then uh, strengthening their skills on how to source, conceptualize, and use education data from both global and regional sources to address gap, uh, the gaps that they're seeing uh, in, in their own context, and also uh, with an emphasis on what data we have available for education inequalities and how we are making use, use of this. Um, so while all of these activities that I mentioned have been key for promoting knowledge exchange related to the use of data for policy and planning, it was in the learning cycle that the country representatives of the hub had a chance to have a deep dive in the topic and produce knowledge about their context as well. So the learning cycle I'm talking about was organized uh, by the hub in partnership with the UNESCO International Institute for Educational Planning, and it focused specifically on equitable access to education with geospatial data. For those who are not familiar with the formats of the learning cycles, just very briefly, those are professional development opportunities that take place across several weeks and it needs national education experts who work closely, that are working closely with the topic of focus of the learning cycle, not only uh, take part to strengthen their skills, but also conduct an analysis and produce new knowledge about their context, always with an aim to influence education policies, practice, and innovation in their country. It's also an opportunity, of course, for knowledge exchange among these different participants. Uh, and this specific okay. learning, Sorry, how many do? Yes, you have a minute. Yeah, you have a okay, minute. Okay, good. Yes. So this specific learning cycle uh, focused on the use of geospatial data, as I mentioned, and in it, participants learn more about mapping techniques uh, using a geographic information system known as TGYS. We are going to be learning, hearing more about it uh, soon from the next panelists. And uh, it was about how geospatial data can be produced and analyzed to improve equity in education policy planning. Mm -hmm. So the course uh, ran for five weeks, counted with uh, 10 national teams, 51 participants, mostly, most of them over 70% were government representatives. Uh, and we, we're gonna hear a little bit more about the results of this course uh, soon from Mr. Musa and from the Maldives. But basically uh, the national teams produce country case studies examining geospatial data and analyzing education equity challenges mm -hmm. for their context. So the whole goal is that these products are able to promote dialogue in the country uh, and hopefully contribute uh, to policy and planning. Thank you very much, uh, Marina. So now let's actually go to, to Musa from uh, the Ministry of Education of Maldives. 
And uh, I have the following questions for him. I know that his country benefited uh, from the learning cycle and have been able to produce a, a very interesting case study. So, we, so the question, uh, Mr. Musa, is that um, uh, we know that the ministry uh, is inter interested in, among other things, addressing disparities in terms of access to education in the Maldives. How might uh, geospatial data support the ministry in doing that? And uh, if it is the case, how do you do participation in the hubs learning cycle is helping you to better use geospatial data? Over to you. Um. Hi, good morning, good afternoon and greeting from the Maldives. Um, thank you, thank you so much. Um, um, like you mentioned, actually we have um, a couple of points to be highlighted with regard to the program or the use of geospatial uh, data. The first point is that uh, the perspective that it uh, it brought to us, um, it actually it I opened us to uh, to a new kind of um, way of thinking because uh, previously uh, or until recently we we have been um, allocating resources based on um, student population and the general understanding of of our staff, the respective staff. Uh, 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 in, I mean. Uh, who do the budgeting and planning, the general understanding of the uh, geography. So he or she is supposed to have some basic um, geographic understanding, but not uh, a kind of systematic um, geospatial data. So mm -hmm. it was very uh, eye-opening to us in terms of um, uh, how the geospatial data could be used in terms of uh, resource allocation and other things uh, as well. Um, the, the second thing we noticed was, I mean, we, we do have an EMIS educational information management system, and we have been using the system for the past um, five uh, years, I would say. Uh, uh, of course, we do have the latitude and longitude of the schools or the institution, but the extraction of the geospatial data and the use of um, geospatial data has not uh, uh, was not uh, actually a practice. Like I mentioned before, um, there wasn't any uh, perspective into the use of um, geospatial data. So um, uh, we see that there is a data gap and the application or the use of geospatial data with the um, existing data sets that we have uh, would make a comprehensive data sets in term of uh, you know cross matching uh, our existing resources with the geospatial data would make uh, more comprehensive data sets and uh, fill the, uh, I mean, in terms of uh, addressing the data gap. And uh, we were very, um, we, we noticed the tool itself, the QGIS tool itself is um, uh, a kind of, uh, uh, is a tool in the sense because it generates very summarized, simplified uh, charts and reports, uh, which can be kind of pr uh, presented to uh, non-technical, uh, people uh, where, I mean, information could be easily interpreted and uh, uh, with the dots and the, the distances and, and so on. So we, we were uh, very um, uh, kind of impressed with the how, uh, I mean, the QGS as a tool uh, generates different tool, I mean, different reports and charts and so on. Um, so uh, I wouldn't say um, in terms of application of the knowledge, uh, uh, we have recently taken uh, uh, some decisions even to extend the uh, access of education, particularly um, introduction of A-level in, in, in few other regions. But although these decisions were not entirely based on geospatial data, I would say uh, these uh, uh, data sets were kind of a leverage factor in terms of a, a kind of a, uh, while we were taking the decision. Because when it comes to Maldives, um, it's a, uh, we have a islands uh, clustered in, in groups, it's dispersed. So like I mentioned before, uh, we, we need to have a very good understanding of our own geography, but having to have a kind of a, a real data set that can uh, see how, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, let's say for example, secondary or higher secondary is distributed across the, uh, across the nation uh, was a very uh, a kind of, uh, 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 important factor for, for, for us. Um, as, a, as a way forward, we, we feel like there is um, a demand for us to kind of uh, build 
more staff, I mean, human capacity and uh, bringing more, um, conducting more such programs, especially to the technical staff who are involved in terms of uh, allocating uh, resources and uh, um, doing this uh, uh, ground, ground level work. So um, yeah. as of now, uh, we have only kind of handful of few staff, especially uh, who, who kind of deal with data and data analytics and data extraction. Mm -hmm. So um, as a way forward, we believe we, we should continue uh, exploring more opportunities in terms of um, training uh, human uh, uh, and capacity building. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, um, this is very interesting. I have just a uh, I follow up questions because you have uh, mentioned a few needs here uh, in terms of staff uh, of staff and human capacity but uh, what kind of uh, uh, environment institutional environment organizational environment do you think you need uh, to be able to do this i know that uh, the maldives is an archipelago with so many uh, uh, islands as you say it's very dispersed um, so if you were, do, do you think that currently you, the ministry has the capacity to do this or is there any other uh, type of uh, uh, needs you have uh, from uh, like from the, the hub in terms of uh, uh, the knowledge, but, uh, but also the other physical uh, and, and financial support? What, what, would, uh, what would you say in terms of those kind of needs? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that's a very good question. I guess yes. Um, of course, uh, we uh, we need uh, support both in terms of uh, uh, guiding us to the um, in 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 more of a technical way ahead, and also in terms of uh, maybe conducting these kinds of programs uh, such that uh, uh, the data awareness and data skill is uh, spread across the nation, especially within the ethos, mm -hmm. and also particularly within the Ministry of Education, um, uh, uh, within the uh, department uh, of the Ministry of Education, uh, but um, and the department which uh, handles the memes and the data, um, uh, the data and also uh, the when, when we allocate the resources and things like that. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. So we have reached the end of our uh, panel discussion. So now we think we have enough time. We actually have um, uh, around, I think it's 2.57. We're supposed to finish at 3.15. Uh, so a little bit less than the 20 minutes that I had planned for. So we'd like to go to the Q&A. And um, I'd like to see whether in the Q&A uh, box here, if we have questions or maybe in the chat, uh, I would ask uh, my colleagues here to help me. Um, Erin Alejandro, is there any questions that you have and, uh, in, 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 the, in the chat here or the Q&A uh, box? Yes, thank you, Hamidou. <clears throat> Sorry, I would say one of the, the first questions that we could ask is, what benefits do country partners see in cross-country collaboration on data system strengthening? And that would be for our participants um, from, from the government. So, uh, Alpha. Uh, Alpha, have you heard the question? Uh, otherwise, we yes, can, go to- Yes, can you hear yes. me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so you have, you, a, you have heard the question. You. Hello, uh, Aaron, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Yes, so the question is, um, what, what, sorry, what benefits do country partners see in cross-country collaboration on data system strengthening? So that peer learning exchange um, between countries that, that KIC supports. How does that help? Okay. Your yeah, thank you very much. That's a very good um, question. Uh, I think the one of the advantage of uh, cross country um, collaboration and networking is helping us to really learn from each other, uh, particularly sharing the best practices and uh and the community of uh, practice that we are learning because all the country are not 
are unique. <clears throat> of course, one objective to provide data for to support decision making, uh, particularly for learning. But it's it's, it's a it's an opportunity where uh, Gambia, for example, is sharing um, knowledge with Uganda or uh, another country in the West Africa, like um, we've had in the Kicks Symposium, where we are really cross fertilizing ideas, and you will see that. So every country have some comparative advantage, and the, even the, the 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 initial knowledge that I have somebody that I can relate to in in Uganda or in Ghana or another country to ask a question, you know, on WhatsApp now it is it is a really um, something that is very good, and the fact that as part of the DHIS program we are getting people. Uh, across the continent, particularly from the hips uh, groups, this is very, very good. Uh, earlier on, when I mentioned about one of the solutions we got uh, in terms of the uh, individual ID address was as a partnership of working with cross-country collaboration from other countries. So I would really recommend that um, this is one of the things that has been lacking and missing. And the fact that we are having a renewed approach, renewed agenda, and going forward with new data system, this country collaboration should be something that we can really uh, learn is like peer review, peer peer learning exchange with you know connection. This is very very uh, useful and it's cost effective. And we recommend that uh, we build uh, we we strengthen the relationship between countries and partners so that it, we can learn and continue learning always together. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Alpha. Voenji, uh, est-ce que vous avez compris, vous avez eu la traduction de la question? Voenji, uh, did you hear the question and did you hear it translated into French a moment ago? Hello, Voenji from Madagascar, did you hear the question? Perhaps she did not hear. Are you still with us? Are you still connected? Ah, she's muted. Ah, okay. Apparemment, votre micro est fermé. Your microphone is muted, Fuanji. Can you please turn on your microphone? Otherwise, okay, I'll, I'll go to uh, Musa. Musa, you've heard uh, the question uh, regarding the benefits uh, that yeah, one... Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, okay, yeah, all right. Thank you. Um, okay. The, the most important that thing that we learned during the I mean program apart from the I mean program itself uh, is um, with regard to you know cross-country collaboration and uh, having to meet from um, you know the the opportunity that we got to know each other and learning experiences from uh, how I mean they do I mean uh, in different countries and especially the the opportunity that we get to get to um, kind of network with the different people from different Part of the world, I think that's uh, that's a wonderful experience uh, mm -hmm. uh, that we get. Uh, and um, the sessions were conducted in a very um, collaborative manner. So uh, it wasn't just a presentation, but more of uh, um, uh, even though it was conducted online, the the sessions were quite interactive. From countries, I mean, uh, participants from different countries, uh, I think was quite much engaged. So I think it was great. Um, uh, uh, experience in terms of cross-country collaboration. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, so now I have a, a second question, but this one is addressed to Renaud, Thierry, and Marina. So the question is, how can you expect to use data for decision-making in countries where data is lacking due to uh, paucity of research and human resources? Hello, maybe Thierry, do you want to take it first or? Yeah, no, it's, uh, okay. that's an excellent chicken and egg problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how to use data if there is no data and how to build yeah, capacity. Exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, I guess the, the question is at what level are we looking? Because we can look at some depressing statistics at the international level on SDG indicators. Mm -hmm. But if you go to schools, there is a lot of data. I mean, it's impossible to run a school without generating a lot of data. So 
One question mm -hmm. is whether that's digitized or not. And that is somehow in inevitable. Uh, I think that digitalization seeps into everything. So uh, then for me, with going back to what I was saying earlier, it's more a question of what data is then relevant at district level and national level mm -hmm. to, to come up with policies and interventions that are not mm -hmm. years behind development of what is happening at the school. So I think um, there, there, there is data and the data that is actually coming for, from operational activities is also often of good quality because it matters to the people who generate it uh, mm -hmm. rather than the data that is just used for reporting and statistics, which might not have you know, an immediate purpose at the school or district level. So I think it's it's more of what what data to focus on, uh, what is meaningful, and that's that's where we try to work mm -hmm. uh, work with all the different levels. Really trying to my mm -hmm. my my concern is to try to empower school inspectors. This this role mm -hmm. that is supposed to you know look after quality at school and that is directly somehow connected to the district and and, and can be a bridge to policy as well. So how to empower mm -hmm. this 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 level uh, in in kind of with, with data-driven data decision-making. But I, mm -hmm. I think the data is there somehow. Yeah, but just as a follow-up question with that, because uh, what are you learning now that you are working with, with, with districts uh, in terms of their the capacity that is there? I, I know that, you know, in the past, all the focus has been on the, uh, you know, at the central level to get the information from MS to the control level where the analysis is done and also the policies are, are derived. Uh, and I know that um, at the district level and at the school, we, uh, we in the 90s and even early 2000, people were talking about school-based management. Uh, but that also uh, implies that you need to have uh, data at the school level uh, with the capacity to interpret that data and, and then make decisions. And the same thing you know, along the chain to the district level. Uh, so what are you uh, learning now that you're engaging with districts like in, 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 Uganda, in Uganda and, and also now the, the, the Gambia? I think um, maybe I can find some links because we have a PhD student who really focus on, you know, the experience, the, the empowerment basically with data at the district level in Uganda. Monica, a PhD with our, our program. And I think there, there is some, some beauty in the enthusiasm around having data that is you know, not yearly census-based, but, but to, to, have a, to be able to monitor what is happening on the ground on a more uh, frequent basis. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one challenge is that in many, in many country education sectors, there isn't that much dedicated budget lines for you know, analytical capacity mm -hmm. at the district level. Exactly. And that has been prioritized maybe more over the years in health. So there, there is that capacity to work with. Uh, you just need to work with, you know, what are the indicators and how can we improve? But but there is at least that baseline of of, of mandate uh, for decision making and, and evidence based mm -hmm. analysis. So I think mm -hmm. um, brokering for policy to to get, you know, positions, yeah. monitoring and evaluation officers that can work together with with cross sector planners and come up with kind of comprehensive interventions, because health yeah. and education, as I said, is tightly connected, you know, influences each other. So you, yeah. you definitely need a strong representative at the district level that can broker for exactly. education data and show its mm -hmm. its value. Yeah, and also maybe a decentralization policy. I don't know, because some countries have, uh, you know, trying to I decentralize. Think, yeah. Uh, I mean, having read quite a few policies, it seems like even from the 90s, that has been the intention. Um, yeah. But then it hasn't really but, been reflected in, in, the, in, exactly. the, in the budget lines and the uh, ability yeah. to build that capacity. Exactly. Renault, uh, I think the same thing with DMS, because what you're trying to do is yeah. really to foster that kind of uh, a learning uh, and, and, and uh, you know, with a, a very fine granular analysis of the data to really inform uh, the, the different levels of, of, the, of decision making. So uh, how are you finding that, that you're trying to merge all these different data sets and also working with, the, with, the, with some of the lower levels uh, of decision making. Yeah, thanks, Amidou. Um, I, I would agree with Terje on, um, on the fact that from what we've seen so far in our 14 participating countries, data is there. Um, it's sometimes that data, administrative data is undervalued. So it's about showing ministries of education, look guys, you have all of those millions of variables sitting there. You know, how can we make the best out of it? 
Um, I think that when there is no, or when the data really, when the data quality is really not good enough, I think that in one or two countries, we have used learning assessments. You know, we have CIPLM in Asia, we have PASEC in Francophone Africa. So we're kind of piggybacking on this to kind of have a nationally representative idea of uh, foundational literacy and numeracy in, in, in a country. Um, and when it comes to district level, I think what we're seeing in a lot of, and this is very encouraging because we are post COVID, but we just came out of the COVID crisis. But what we're seeing in a lot of countries is that there are GP applications going in, you know, to strengthen data systems. There are other foundations like Big Win making millions of dollars investments with ministries of education to strengthen those, those systems. UNESCO, UNICEF is here to provide technical assistance when needed. Um, mm -hmm. So overall, I, 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 I am feeling like there are a lot of, uh, of opportunities uh, to mm -hmm. strengthen data systems at country level. And it's just about for our research, at least our war for the past two years have been, where are the policy moments? When do you need to submit this application so that we can you know, crush the timeline on data must be so that we can feed this into this application? Mm -hmm. Or when do you have a national conference with teachers? Or when is a big foundations visit coming at country level so that we can showcase you know, the work that the Ministry of Education, the, the planning and budgeting units within Ministries of Education and the research units, you know, are doing. So it's about understanding those policy moments to be able to leverage, you know, to some for bigger investments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe the question to Marina, we have like uh, three minutes left, uh, Marina, uh, three, four minutes uh, in terms of the work that you're doing within the learning cycle, um, trying to get countries to learn from uh, one another, uh, and also trying to have this evidence that is coming out of some of these uh, uh, global research uh, projects on data systems. Uh, how do you think um, this is really uh, helping the countries? We heard that it's really very helpful in, in the Maldives, but what kind of other challenges do you foresee and uh, how are you adjusting also to uh, the, the lessons that you're learning from this particular exercise? So, uh... First, agreeing uh, with uh, colleagues that uh, what we've been, see been seeing in our countries is not that the issue is lack of data, but uh, what is being made with this data. And I think it's the chicken and egg uh, issue is uh, real there in the sense that as we see, as we work with countries in the learning cycles uh, on the use and potential uses of the data, we see also a demand uh, for specific data that is needed. So that can also influence uh, and improve uh, the data collection systems. So uh, we've been seeing through the small contributions uh, as shared by the Maldives that this is quite relevant uh, for the country but we don't aim to be the ones uh, changing the system. So we are there uh, to listen to the demands. This is a specific challenge uh, in our region that we want uh, to strengthen our skills and we want to understand how data can better uh, support our policies in the, this direction. Of mm -hmm. course, uh, the biggest challenge for us is uh, what, happen, what happens after uh, such opportunities of knowledge, knowledge exchange uh, between countries while uh, participants are learning from what works in a, a different context and also learning about what they could be doing with their context. Uh, so, of course, the biggest challenge is the uptake of that. And that yes. means uh, mm -hmm. a, a bigger scale uh, that sometimes uh, we're not able to address at the moment with the scope of hub activities. But we believe mm -hmm. that by having key individuals participating in the learning cycle, these uh, eye-opening, these uh, awareness about the importance uh, mm -hmm. of uh, collecting and analyzing and using these data for specific issues will have um, mm -hmm. a snowball effect uh, in the country and uh, hopefully uh, a contribution uh, going forward as well. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Marina, because the key word is uptake, of course. It's not very easy. We can do all what we can do, but how do we now come up with a strategy to ensure uptake of the evidence that we're producing and also some of the approaches that are being used? So thank you very much. I think we have come uh, to the end of our, uh, our panel here uh, with the discussions. So uh, I'd like to, um, uh, Floro, for you to take over. So over to you, uh, Floro, for the thank facilitation. And I'd like to, before I finish, just to thank our panelists for a great discussion, a great conversation we have just had. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Hamidou, and thank you to all the panelists for this fantastic uh, conversation. Now, I would like to invite uh, again Nasser Farouki from IDRC and Margarita Focuslicht, uh, acting deputy CEO uh, of the Global Partnership for Education, to provide an update on KICS progresses over the last year and some reflections and closing remarks uh, of this year's uh, symposium. So thank you very much, and over to you, Nasser. Well, thanks a lot, Floro, and uh, thank you all uh, panelists. I, I can't tell you how much I learned uh, listening to you. It's really, it was really uh, stimulating and fun. Um, I, uh, you know, we are going to talk about sort of uh, an update on kicks and, and where we're heading, but I did want to share a few things that resonated uh, with me about this particular panel. Um, IDRC supported an open data for development uh, program for many years. In fact, we are uh, still supporting it. Um, it's contributing to the open government partnership um, and helped um, to develop this open data charter, which is being adapted by many governments and organizations. And listening to you talk about issues relating to data at the education um, in the education sector reminded me of it. The principles in that charter are open by default timely and comprehensible, accessible and usable, comparable and interoperable, and that it should be used for improved governance and citizen engagement and for inclusive development and innovation. You can, you can Google that. Some of you might find that interesting. I think all the work that you're all doing contributes and, and rests um, and builds on those kinds of principles. Um, you know, one of the things, Terry, that you said that resonated with me was the importance of collecting data at the district level, the subnational level, and the importance of strengthening capacity to collect, share, analyze, use that data. Um, the importance of merging data sets, Alpha, as you mentioned, such, such as health and, and education uh, data sets. And in fact, some of the outcomes we talk about um, for KICS are um, countries that have done that and then um, were guided in terms of school reopenings by merging those data sets. So we already see the, the benefits um, of that. Renault, I was fascinated to hear about uh, women-led schools performing better um, than um, male-led schools. Um, yeah, the, the title of your project, I always smile when I hear the title of the pro of your project, but I, I get it. Um, it's, uh, we're, we're looking for positive deviance, so thank you for, for that. Um, I was really thrilled to hear that based on the work that you're doing, that Ghana is now applying for a system capacity grant. And that's one of the things as we go forward uh, is building connections between the different parts of what GPE uh, is doing overall and, and how Kix is contributing uh, to it. And that's a great example. And uh, Marina, I've seen some of the, the EAP podcasts, uh, wonderful to see. And I, I was really happy to hear how some of our global projects, uh, in this case, you talked about data to, uh, to speak, speaking at the KIX um, webinar, um, so that we're seeing this cross fertilization between the global projects, between the applied research and the hubs, which of course is, is something that, um, you know, is the point of the hub about sharing knowledge and putting it into use. Um, and, and Musa, I was struck about one of the things you said, you said it was eye-opening to see how geospatial data can be used to fill gaps um, in data sets and, um, and then be used to, to better allocate resources. Um, so that really resonates and underlines the point that someone just made about the importance of demand. Um, because at the end of the day, there's no point in collecting, collecting data unless decision makers, policy makers, community, group, community groups, and, and others want that data and then are gonna use it and, and reuse it um, for important purposes um, to, to advance development and in this case, education. Um, and then finally, um, you know, some of the, 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 talk, the discussion was about the importance of, okay, the data is there, we wanna make it open and, and by default, but, um, we do have to be careful um, in terms of security and the importance of privacy laws, the importance of data protection laws um, and frameworks to, to govern, govern those, um, which I, I don't personally think is insurmountable given we've been working on, on these issues for 10 years. They're very important issues, but they're not insurmountable. So um, I, 
really enjoyed um, this discussion and I wish I had more time to 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 talk to you and 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 listen to you because it's fascinating really just want to thank you for the wonderful work that you're doing and um, sharing it in such a concise way with it with us you're all fantastic and your presentation is super clear um, I'm just going to take a few minutes now to talk a little bit about where we're going and to kind of close the session before handing it off, close the session with Margarita um, and hand it off to her. Um, so overall, stepping back, I mean, the symposium it, um, has been wonderful over the last couple of days. Um, the session on gender equality yesterday was, was also wonderful. We're really pleased with the progress that KICS is making despite the challenging circumstances of the past few years. Um, it's been great to hear from government representatives um, in um, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Madagascar, Gambia, the Maldives about how the applied research in the regional um, hubs um, are useful to their work and ultimately bringing evidence to um, practices. And as I said, we're really grateful that you took um, the time to share your experiences um, with us. Um, thought, if you hadn't really heard about it, to, to um, share a little bit about the midterm evaluation of the Knowledge and Innovation Exchange. Um, the headline is that the, the midterm evaluation found that KICS has made significant progress. It's valued by stakeholders, it's well positioned by impact. Uh, GP for impact GP countries reported that they found KICS useful um, and um, that they've learned from each other's experiences, which is you know one of the, the key uh, design features of, of KICS. We're happy to see that um, there is movement on scaling innovation um, because of course there's a lot of innovations that exist, but unless you actually scale them for greater impact, um, then we're, we're, we're really leaving something on the table. Um, and we're really happy to hear about the KICS Observatory um, during the pandemic and how many countries learned from others um, and documented effective practices such as Ethiopia and Senegal's targeted back to school campaigns that spoke uh, directly to vulnerable uh, learners. So um, I, I just wanted to reiterate that um, based on that evaluation, um, we are really um, committed to go in, uh, to, to, to invest in, in kicks additionally and take it further um, to, to build on, on um, what we've learned so far and the impacts that we are starting to see. Um, so over to my colleague Margarita, um, who is um, my colleague from GP and the Kicks Executive Committee to share more about our plans for the future for Kicks. Margarita, and thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Nasser. And I, I so agree with you. I think we've seen some really interesting examples over these two days on how Kix is supporting evidence and, and knowledge that sparks relevant effective education system policies. It's really, really exciting. And to us at the GPE Secretariat, a critical indicator of Kix's success is that partners at country level especially find it valuable. And I'm just so pleased to hear from so many corners that that's the case, including through the midterm evaluation, but also through what I hear when I meet people at different events recently at the at the System Transformation Summit in New York and, and, and just when I run into partners, it's, it's really great to see. Um, so I'm going to conclude the symposium by as, as Nazar indicated by highlighting some of the key priorities as we take kicks forward. And uh, maybe to start with what reiterating what our acting CEO and GPE, Charles North mentioned at his opening yesterday, uh, KICS is really a critical asset for GPE to help strengthen evidence-informed policy dialogue. And as such, it's a key driver um, for system transformation, which is core to GPE strategy. And so together with IDRC, um, we're, we'll continue to look for ways to effectively work with and support partners to develop and implement education system transformation and to learn from one another in the process. And so uh, concretely, KICS, I think, is poised to support aspects of partners' countries' work to identify sector bottlenecks and develop evidence-based strategies to address these. Uh, and in, in a way that complements the actions and uh, by of other partners as well as of other assets and, and grants of GPE. So 
and we'll also within that continue to work to strengthen gender our gender equality work through the hubs and the research grants. And it was really interesting um, yesterday to hear from the different panelists on on how they're addressing gender in and through education. So CAKES will continue to generate evidence for gender transformative pedagogy, prevention of sexual and gender-based violence in schools, and in general, the development of inclusive policies that reflect multiple aspects, not just gender, of individual and group identities, um, also socioeconomic status, ability, ethnicity, class, among other, other areas. Um, but in line with GPE's commitment to hardwiring gender in all our support, all KICS projects uh, will integrate gender responsive or gender transformative approaches and uh, grantee capacity to integrate these will be strengthened through learning from an upcoming gender equality knowledge synthesis of the KICS portfolio. Uh, this will inform future calls for proposals, guide cross-country learning exchange, and strengthen efforts and capacity to promote policy uptake. Uh, a further priority will be synthesizing knowledge from KICS projects on key themes uh, as with data like we've heard today, leveraging these to consolidate emerging evidence and promising solutions, and sharing the results with the broader education community. And as GPE's evidence arm, we're excited to note that Kix is now positioned to support our engagement in key global dialogues on themes like gender, equality, data, the role of technology in education, um, and early years approaches to learning and school readiness. And Kix will also continue to strengthen its ability to be more responsive to the ongoing needs of partner countries. For example, through the provision of rapid and on-demand reviews of global and regional evidence to respond to policy moments. I think I heard some of that mentioned earlier in the session today and work with governments to co-create and commission research on key national policy reform areas. We'll seek ways to link kicks effectively to policy processes and help infuse evidence throughout the policy cycle. And that would include engaging efficiently and effectively with different technical and political tiers of government, with civil society, development partners, and academia. Really, I think, create a community around knowledge and evidence and, and sharing across that community relevant evidence that can concretely support uh, partner countries at the critical moments in their decision-making processes. Um, so in the coming weeks, uh, GPE's committees and board will be considering whether to approve a costed extension of kicks that would take uh, kicks into well into 2027. And if approved, that um, that costed extension would accelerate the achievement of these priorities and allow kicks to strengthen the range of ways um, it supports GPE partner countries. So to close, I'm going to borrow a thought from Nazar and talk a little bit about why evidence is so critical. And it, we're alarmed really by the reduction of education resources in a world facing multiple crises at the moment. And when this is juxtaposed with a deepening learning crisis following COVID, it's clear that we need to work together to ensure education resources are used as effectively and efficiently as possible. The effective mobilization and use of evidence and knowledge can help lead to more meaningful, sustained, and impactful change and yield a greater return on education sector investments and value for money. That's so critical as we're seeing the, the budgets, uh, the threats to education budgets across the world. So in closing this year's um, KICK Symposium, I'd like to thank uh, the Ministry of Education and KICK's grantee panelists who share their insights and brought kicks to life for us, as well as my partners and colleagues at IDRC, uh, my colleagues from the GPE Secretariat, the interpreters, and all the participants who have joined over the last two days. I really hope it's been as useful for you as it's been for me, and uh, I wish you all the best and um, hope to see you next year at the, uh, the symposium, but preferably before. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, everybody. Everybody, thanks for attending.